Hello and welcome to the Cyber Den with your host, me, Jake the Voice Pa. Now, today we've got another wonderful special guest that we're going to be chatting to. Please welcome professional actor, singer, and composer Mel McMurrin, best known as the voice of Calypso from Twist and Metal 2 to 4. Thanks for coming, mate. Thank you, Jake. It's great to be here. And welcome to a twisted interview. <laughs> now, Mel, let's get started uh, with a bit of a bread and butter question. So, what inspired you to enter the world of acting and singing? All right. Good question. Uh, acting, I think the pivotal moment was at about six years old. I did a magic show for my parents. And I had a thing where I uh, had a banana that I pre-cut with a needle and thread. So when I opened the banana, it was in magically three parts. And I screwed the whole thing up. And my parents cracked up so much that I started mugging and I made it worse than it was. And they were on the floor laughing. <laughs> and uh, then I got uh, in high school, some attractive uh, girls came and said, uh, we, need, we need Father Drobny in the school play. Would you please come and and audition for Father Drobny. And he turned out to be a magician who uh, screws everything up. And so my acting was born. Now, I was singing since the age of two. Um, my first gig that I'm aware of was at two uh, at a church in Chicago uh, singing before a civil rights march. So this was in the 60s. Uh, my parents <clears throat> were um, active in the civil rights uh, movement there in Chicago. So I didn't shake his hand, but uh, I was in my mother's arms as my dad and mother shook uh, Martin Luther King's hand. So that tells you how old I am. Some fascinating history right there. Well, let me shoot this question to you. Do you, <laughs> do you have any perhaps um, favorite actors or singers that perhaps come to mind? Any that you would describe as an inspiration as well? Wow. Um... Let me go with singer since I always said since I started at two, I've always been primarily, I thought, a singer, but that changes from year to year, hour to hour. Um, oh, well, I was an opera singer. I was not a tenor, but I loved Pavarotti. I just thought uh, there was a goldenness to his voice, um, a silkiness that I haven't heard in other singers. I know people argue about the great tenors, but Pavarotti was special uh, to me. So he was an inspiration, even though I'm a bass and a baritone in the other realm. Um, and then pop singers. I grew up um, loving Motown singers, so Marvin Gaye probably influenced me more than anybody or as much as anybody. Acting-wise, you see, even though I am an actor, I'm not a actor fan if that or I'm not a movie buff or I'm not somebody who's read tons of scripted plays but um hmm my dad loved Richard Burton and he always said that sounded like Richard Burton so that was encouragement and I, I'm impressed by just about everybody name somebody and I'll probably say yeah I especially camera I always found I didn't do much on camera and I was always amazed that people could um, put things out of sync and just just act on cue. I mean, I'm comfortable doing it on mic, I guess. So, is that enough answer for your question? It is indeed. It is indeed. And I've got another question right here. So, you've taken part in a lot of gigs, like you know, there's things like uh, Entree to Murder, a murder mystery taking place at the Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco, and uh, Lawrence School. Uh, Lawrence's Hall of Science's Brainiacs, teaching high schoolers brain science through improv acting. Uh, you performed musical theater involving Shakespeare and Aladdin, and of course, so much more. So how did you break into this kind of field of work, and how would you uh, describe your experiences? Uh, cool. Well, after, uh, after high school, do you call it high school in, in uh, Great Britain? We call um, it uh, secondary 18. school. Secondary school. Okay. 
So after secondary, um, I didn't know what to do. My mom encouraged me to do broadcasting school. So I did a year of that. So that got me some on-the-mic training. But I wasn't necessarily passionate about that. I, my uncle was a, um accomplished conductor. And as I drove through uh, Texas at the time, he drug me into North Texas State University, a, a good music school in the States, said, sing for these guys. And uh, they admitted me, but they said they didn't have any scholarship money. It was like a week before school was to begin. So I had that in the back of my mind. And then I was, while I was going to broadcasting school, I was singing in a church choir, and a professor from Arizona State University heard me and said, young man, we have some money for you. Uh, Come sing opera. I was like, really? Uh, So I got a full scholarship to study opera. Ironically, I got offered a full-time overnight radio gig uh, when I graduated from broadcasting school in uh, Phoenix. This was a big market, and not even conceiving how I could do both— uh, I called them and and said, uh, "Hey, I'm I'm happy you've offered me this job. Is it possible I could do weekends instead?" And the guy was like, "Are you kidding? Uh, no, thanks. Thank you very much." <laughs> and, um, I didn't realize that um, I was turning down a gift horse in the mouth. And weekend uh, weekenders were very different from Monday through Friday in radio. So I became an opera singer. And um, and then graduated, went to New York, lasted about six months uh, till the money ran out, and headed back to Arizona where I'd gone to school, and um, did shows along the way. Then ended up in California, and yeah, got the uh, the Lawrence Hall of Science was a steady theater gig I did for seven years or so when I arrived in California touring schools, and um doing shows on science, and it led to a a musical group called the Bungee Jumping Cows. I'll promote that simply because it's one of the things I'm most proud of. It is, to my uh, reckoning, the best science-teaching rock band in the world. So uh, look us up on YouTube and see if that's not true. And back to you, Jake. So you've also done like plenty of like commercial work, and of course you mentioned about radio, radio presenter for the formerly country gospel format uh, KASA in Phoenix, Arizona, in the eighties. And again, so that's right. Yeah, what, what can you tell us about your experiences uh, there in the studios at that time? Well, it was ironic because as soon as I graduated from college as an opera singer, I got a job in radio again. Um, Also ironic, I was putting myself through college by working various jobs, including a janitor at a grocery store. I ended up making more as a janitor than I was on air. So that uh, country gospel station was a small, it was a 10,000-watt directional um, antenna. So it did reach into California from Arizona, but it was right along a freeway. Um, And country gospel is big in the States in the uh, Mid-South, in the south of the country, but Arizona, not so much. So I could experiment a lot. I got to do a lot of uh, production work and doing doing commercials and PSAs there in addition to the morning drive slot, which I eventually uh, grew to. And um, so I've been a producer as well as just the, the mystery person behind the mic. And... Uh, I liked that as well. It was, it was quite fun, and I came up with the slogan, "Country Christian and proud of it." Casa, 1540, the home of country gospel. And Jake is speechless. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> taken aback by that brilliant uh, little slogan there. I must keep that in mind. I must plagiarize. I mean, uh, be inspired by it later for my own show. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to do character voices as well. I forget. There was Saddle Sore Sam. And uh, uh, there was some kind of caveman I did too. So it was kind of the beginning of me experimenting with character voices. And I've probably always been a character actor, and luckily as a base in the opera world, you're often cast as some wild character. So I also, interestingly, around that time, did a stage play 
Um, what was that called? Originally, I think it was called Dream of Flight, and uh, I can't remember the name. It was one word. Anyway, I played a villain that was very, very close to what ended up becoming Calypso and Twisted Metal. Um, in fact, I played numerous villains and uh, always pulled that that uh, sadistic, somewhat Mid-South Vincent Price voice out for people. So that was kind of the beginning of my villain career. Funny you should mention that. It's about the, uh, you know, the Calypso voice before becoming Calypso. Of course, we will be getting into that question in just a moment. Because that, um, that was actually a particular voice I picked up on when I was like an up-and-coming voice actor a good eight-plus years ago. And that, when I was checking out the cutscenes from the Twisted Metal games, I was, like, trying to impersonate that because I thought, I love this voice. I want to use that in video games and try and get auditions. And it did land me, like, you know, one or two in my, you know, like, say, earlier stuff. It did actually work. But I listen back to it now and I think, oh, well, this this version I'm doing is terrible. Like, i, I got to go back and refresh my mind with, you know, the OG Calypso. <laughs> well, you and me both. In fact, when I listen to uh, the cutscenes from Twisted Metal 3 and 4, I'm like, ooh, I didn't quite get it like I did in 1. 1 is the, the seminal OG uh, Calypso. Even, I mean, 2, 2, 2. Although 1, if you've, have you heard the original 1 that wasn't in the game, but was uh, there is audio recorded for Twisted Metal 1, and... I just heard that recently, and I thought, you know, they must have played this for me because it sounds a it sounds close to my calypso. There's something I think I took from that uh, to do the the calypso in two. So I do say the OG, but there was a calypso before. It just he didn't have a voice in in Twisted Metal One. It was they didn't have the bandwidth in those days to include voice. That's true, and also the. They originally weren't going to be shooting cutscenes, but apparently they thought they kind of like, when they were all done, they kind of put a, pulled a 180 and they thought, uh, this, this is a bit campy, this. Let's, let's not put it on the disc. Let's just use like text to uh, say what Calypso is saying. But anyway, anyway, so let's move on to, of course, yes, let's talk about video games and for starters, Twisted Metal 2. So how did you land the role for the cunning Calypso of Twisted Metal and what sort of approach did you go for when performing the character? Or did you get any like additional kind of feedback from the, uh, the developers and the crew while you were performing him, etc.? But please, tell us more. Yeah, well, it was an audition. I believe it was a casting director. I had an agent, but I got a lot of my gaming stuff through a specific casting director for gaming. It was, it was at the time, in, in the early 90s, like an unknown or up and coming thing. It wasn't, in fact, I had actor friends that said, oh, you're doing video games? That's weird. (laughs) It was not the giant thing that it is now. And so even my agent, it was off their radar. So I had a casting director that called me for auditions. And that, um, that script, as I remember in the description, said uh, a cross between Vincent Price and Tim Curry from Rocky Horror Picture Show. So th- those are the directions. And then shout out to the excellent direction from Buzz Burroughs, who was the um, engineer producer. And he really locked it in. And then I worked with him for two and three as well. So he created that voice as well. We spent, oh, at least a half hour or so getting getting it in, locking it in. And then um, the rest is history. So like I said, I had this character that I'd done on stage, which was very similar, the kind of sadistic, uh, cartoony, evil, evil, evil guy. So I already had that a similar voice in my repertoire. And um, yeah, it was, a, it was a hoot. It was hard uh, because I wasn't acting with the other voice actors. They, all, they were all recorded individually as far as I know. So any of the dialogue is, if it suffers from anything, it was that we weren't responding to each other. But, yeah, it was great fun. What is it that you love about playing the character? And are there any favorite quotes or lines or, or any moments that stick out to you? <laughs> um, well, I think I like doing all these evil dudes that I often do because uh, 
at least people tell me I'm the exact opposite. I'm a very low-key, nice guy. (laughs) And so my inner id gets to come out and I can scare people. Um, As far as lines, um, oh, you know, there was, this is not in the game, but I think there was a line from uh, Enter the Dragon, a Bruce Lee movie, and all my friends and I used to do that, even though I don't think I'm doing it justice, but it was, you want more time? Um, so that's right. We did a number of villains. Um, so let me get a Calypso line that sticks. Uh, the world will be my battleground. There will be no survivors. I promise you that. Welcome, driver, to Twisted Metal. Always sends chills down my spine whenever I like re-listen to that part of the uh, the opening of Twisted Metal Two. Brilliant. Yeah, oh, thank you, thank you. But um, moving on, of course, to uh, yeah, you, know, you mentioned about Twisted Metal Three and Four. Like, you know, it just seems to have just severely limited dialogue offered to you by Nine Eight Nine Studios when, of course, they were told to make those games and. Again, I'm guessing that you know these performances weren't quite as weren't quite as memorable or enjoyable, probably because of the writing. Would you say? Hmm. Yeah, I can't say that specifically, but I don't know. Um, I don't want to don't want to throw anybody under the bus because I'm probably as much to blame as anything, as far as the performance goes. Anyway, it did still have buzz as the producer, and my memory is that we might have been a little more pressed for time. So they were recorded quite quickly, I think, and uh, but Buzz upped my rate significantly, but uh, but yeah, not my lines. I became kind of one of the drivers. Now I haven't played the games, but I think it's about equal equal with the driver performances. Not not much. Well, four, I think he is a driver, something like that. So yeah, it didn't. So it didn't have the ringleader kind of feel. That could also be the ascension of Sweet Tooth. Because Sweet Tooth is sort of the really marquee character um, for the franchise. That, that's what people know. You know, when I've told uh, friends who sort of know video games, I was in Twisted Metal, and they're like, oh, were you the burning clown head? I'm like, no. Although I did audition for um, the burning clown head. Uh, I think it was Twisted Metal Black. Now, do you know, did David Jaffe do, was it Twisted Metal Black or another one that he did? coming back. I don't know my Twisted Metal history like I should. At any rate, he invited me um, because we connected on Twitter and uh, said, hey, sorry, I'm uh, Calypso's already been cast, but would you like to do Sweet Tooth? And so I spent, I think it was a week, uh, doing these lines in my home studio. My wife kind of put her foot down and said, uh, I don't want this in the house anymore. I'm tired of listening to it. Because it was pretty sadistic and, and weird. And she could hear it even outside the studio. Um, and I did not get that. It wasn't right. It wasn't right, the right fit. So timing, I should have been doing the marketing and staying in contact with, with David and with the whoever was owning Twisted Metal at the time. So that's a lesson to all you voiceover folks. Keep your contacts up. I gave it a little bit more thought about, you know, you mentioned about, you know, we were talking about Twisted Metal 3 and 4. I still think that your performance was still, I'd still say it's bang on. But I understand when you mentioned about time, um, because I believe number three in development was quite rushed. And I think that kind of reflect is reflected in the, uh, the writing because it's quite formulaic. It's like, you know, ending starts, here's your wish, backfire say the motto like it, it was like all of them were like that there was no back and forth dialogue or anything like that like in twisted metal 2 so but again i still think um you were still like you know you were still on point with your delivery because it, it's funny because when i've been doing the cyber den for that was roughly eight years presenting radio show we, we do a, a section called bad voice acting in video games and um yeah twisted metal 3 uh, a lot of the characters not you thankfully not you but the other characters we listened to, and we were like, oh, God, this is terrible. Like, is this guy trying to do a, a London accent? Because I, I find this half offensive, quite honestly. Like, some of the voices in that game were bad, really bad, to be honest. Yeah, 
I don't remember if I heard them or not, but I don't think we spent the time, you know, locking the voice in like we did that first that first one. Because I remember it, it, it was difficult to get it uh, nailed because I had these other villains in my head, and it's been difficult since. You know, I have to be sure I'm not doing another uh, villain that I've done. Now I have, uh, like, Clips is not as low as I would, I, I tend to make him lower. My voice has maybe gotten a little lower, so I would like to speak down here. But that is another villain I've done where Clips. Calypso is more in the middle here. And there's a new Calypso, but he's not Calypso. Um, if I can jump over to uh, something I did this year, a character called Jackal Vacha. I am Jackal Vacha. So Calypso fans will probably know, recognize the voice, but hopefully he's different enough. Although I had somebody uh, in the production crew go, oh, that sounds just like Calypso, so... Hopefully Sony doesn't come chasing me and say, what's all this Calypso everywhere? Although, yeah, I've done uh, Calypso for birthdays and weddings and things as well. So I always have to, I go back to those uh, cut scenes from Twisted Metal 2 and try to lock it in again. The world will be my battleground. That's the key line. Have you kept up with the uh, the Twisted Metal series over the years? And, you know, there's also been, of course, the uh, new TV show. Uh, also, of course, I think I already know the answer for this one. But if you did get handed the opportunity to, replies, to reprise Calypso officially, would you take it? Again, I'm pretty sure like 99.9% know the answer here. Definitely. But uh, I think that's a very, very long shot. Um I'm not A or B list in the in the uh, on screen world or the voiceover world at this point. So uh, I did uh, try to connect with the director or the casting director on LinkedIn. Never got a reply back. But I thought a cameo, maybe in you know some an Easter egg in the series, I think is the most I could hope for. You know, maybe uh, something in the background of a scene on the radio or who knows what. And I haven't seen the series, I'm ashamed to say. I'm also not much of a gamer, so besides playing in the lobby uh, at Sony, I have not really played Twisted Metal or many games. So sorry to disappoint your listeners, but uh, my gaming uh, is Duolingo, and uh, I do like, um, uh, is it Rock Band? Not Guitar Hero, but the one with a real guitar and a real bass, so so you're not just turning your brain into mush. You're actually learning something as you play this game. <laughs> hey, who said video games can't be educational? I mean, for example, with Twisted Metal, who knew that, uh, you know, like, the ingredients required to make, uh, like, a turbo boost to make vehicles fly faster and the, the destructive capabilities of napalm-infused rockets, you know, these things are still educational in a sense, if you're... If you look hard enough, but maybe that's just me overlooking things like usual. No, I, I think it's a great opportunity. In fact, I have used video games um, for my education. Uh, I'm an addict of language learning. So I, uh, it's funny because video games are in my life, even though I don't play them. But I watch Twitch TV, for instance, and I watch presenters in German and Spanish uh, playing various games. So... Um, I love No Mind Sky. So while I'm working, I'll often just have uh, a Twitch channel with No Mind Sky playing in the background. Or ironically, I forget the game's name. It's about uh, forest fires. <laughs> I think it's set right in the, right in my neck of the woods in California. It looks very familiar. And I think you play a ranger running and uh, with a walkie-talkie, which I'm also into. Um, so it's 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 a good release to just see these scenes, but I don't have to respond to them. I did. Uh, I escaped a forest fire in 2015. My house did not. And uh, every summer since then, we uh, in the area where I live, the next five years we lost. I think it's 65 percent of the county burned. So Northern California, although the last two summers have been great, is a dangerous place. Video games are a good escape in that case, and so and it's great to um, to hear them in other languages. 
In fact, I, I asked somebody about doing the German or Spanish of some game. Maybe it was that uh, Sweet Tooth audition, and it was like, no, that's a whole other world. Um, those are done after the fact by other, other production companies. We don't mess with that at all. What is your reaction to uh, the popularity, of course, of the Twisted Metal series, with many people, of course, citing the second game as the favorite and telling you that, you know, you've been a big part of their childhood? Yes, it's a great, um, well, it keeps me in the game to some extent because, um, you know, I veered off in the corporate world for 15 years and, um, you know, music and voiceover kind of took a side, side position, so... Uh, there probably is not six months that goes by without getting fan mail. And, of course, with this TV series coming up, uh, it's been every week. That voice I did earlier for the amusement park, Jackal Vacha, uh, that was a Twisted Metal fan who grew up. And there's a lot of those. So I do get voiceover work from... Uh, 13-year-olds who grew into 35- and 40-year-olds. And um, so that's pretty fun. It, it is a good... Uh, I'm glad I have that on my resume, as sick as the character is, because it's probably the most uh, notoriety uh, that I've gotten, and and it is a loyal fan base, a very passionate fan base. So they're fun to talk to. You've also lended your voice to other titles like Cool Borders, Mortimer and the Riddles of the Medallion, which you co-wrote the music to as well, and so much more. So anything perhaps you could say about any any other video game roles that stick out to you? Yeah, well, Cool Borders, that's right. Some people recognize Cool Borders and don't know Twisted Metal, ironically. So that was a wild uh, story in casting. I think... I got it because of Calypso. I don't think I auditioned. I think I was just called in. And um, because uh, the Japanese producers wanted Eddie Murphy and they couldn't get him. So <laughs> the producer was like, can you do uh, Eddie Murphy? So I was doing a very bad Ed Eddie Murphy uh, imitation. And that's the, the genesis of that voice. So lines like, no, oh, you look terrible. Uh I can't remember them all, but um, yeah, I don't think anyone would hear Eddie Murphy now in that, but that was how that voice uh, occurred. And then Mortimer, the Riddles of the Medallion, so that was that band, the Bungee Jumping Cows, and um, yeah, we all, we were hired to write that. I forget where the contact came through, but that was with LucasArts, their educational wing, so we wrote those songs uh and yeah, I'm very proud of those. You can hear them in my demo or you can uh, hear them uh, out there. I think the game didn't go far. It was kind of an odd thing. They had this engine um, from another game that they used for that, but they kept the, um, it was designed for like four and five-year-olds. And the engine let you fly through these environments, but you couldn't really turn unless there was a Y in the road every once in a while and you could turn left or right. But it was... It's like, we don't want these kids just getting lost in this world and crashing. We're going to keep them on a track. So it was kind of like, for those folks who may know Disneyland, the 1950s ride where, and there's probably something uh, in England the same, where you can't really drive off the track. You're locked on like a train. So that was Mortimer and the Riddles of the Medallion. Yeah, I got to sing in that too. Oh, that's right. I wanted to do the voice of the villain, but which I thought would have made sense, but I sang the voice of the um, the villain's henchman, I guess, or hench uh, thing protecting the magic gem. And that's Mortimer. Yeah, that's that was a cool thing. Good music. I think we won an award, a Children's Choice Award or something for that. It was good music. The game could have used a little more work because the, the science, and I was coming from, see, this band, the Bungee Jumpy Cows, were, it was a group of, uh, science teachers and rockers who happened to be moonlighting as actors at this museum because we did the, the museum shows. And so we'd get together after work and write science music. So we were really primed for a good, a science teaching game. And it turns out, well, the gameplay is for four-year-olds, but the science is for 12-year-olds. 
So it was a mismatch, and um, unfortunately, the game did not go anywhere. But you can find it on eBay. I've given some to nieces and nephews over the years, and every once in a while I look for it on eBay. I think it's really hard to find now, and probably not playable on... I don't know if it'll even play on today's systems. But yeah, I think it was... Uh, I think there's a Windows version that may still work. I don't know if old PlayStation or... Uh, I don't remember what the platforms were. It was at least Windows and Mac, and I think Xbox, if it existed then. Don't know. I was going to sing the theme song, Fly the Slimy Skies. Anyway, Mortimer and the Riddles of the Medallion. Back to you. Are there any other games or franchises, anything like that out there, that you would love to lend your voice to? Even maybe musical projects, anything like that? What would you love to get your voice on? Um, well, I've had fans say, well, there's, there's a few projects where people will come up to me and say, did you do that? And it's like, no. Uh, one is, and I don't know the game, but it's the Elder God. Uh, the Elder God, but it's a very low voice. But yeah, I would say anything. Yeah, I will I will try anything. As I've done, uh, yeah, voices up high and voices down low. So yeah, that's 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 a symptom of me not being a real video game aficionado. <laughs> so I can't rattle off the, the franchises that I would love to be a part of. You've also been hard at work for uh, many, many years with audio, video editing, you know, stuff like that. So, and of course you mentioned about going corporate. Uh, anything to mention about all of this? Like, uh, you know, kind of challenges in the field of work, anything interesting that can have happened during it? Or, or is it just something to kind of uh, keep the bills paid, etc.? Yeah, well, I got to be creative uh, in the corporate work. I started in IT, and my wife was doing a webinar program interviewing real estate agents, and their first show, they were all overjoyed about, and then they went to play the recording, and there was nothing. And um, and she convinced the powers that be, who said, we need a tech, because uh, we can't handle this. So I became the tech for this show outside of my IT work. In the meantime, they hired a video company to edit the webinars, and that was Uh, a friend of mine, and and I just did the video editing as well. So when that company was sold, um, I said, hey, by the way, I'm the video editor, and thank goodness I did. I wouldn't have had a job. The webinar program would have gone on without me, so I got hired as a video editor and a webinar producer. Um, That was Homes.com. We had a lot of fun. I got to do all kinds of promos, so I, I kept my voiceover career going kind of in work. I called myself a captured creative I got to write and edit a lot as well. Um, but then that was sold two years ago, so I'm back on the freelance trail. So it's cool you're interviewing me at this point because, yeah, I'm back to 1996 or seven when I booked my first national commercial and said, you know, this school touring stuff that I did for seven years is getting kind of old. I'm going to make it as a full-time itinerant freelance actor. And... That lasted a year before the savings ran out. That uh, that one commercial and the residuals were great, but it didn't eventually pay the bills. So I actually went into corporate life before that, but in the music um, music industry to ill-fated companies uh, that were a lot of fun to work with. Digital Wings for Audio, one of the first, uh, oh, maybe the first 128-track uh, multi-track recording system. But uh, it was Odd Software. That became... Some of the people, when that company went down, were rescued and started a new company called C-Sound with Tom Oberheim. And the synth, uh, one of the guys on Mount Rushmore of synthesizers, so those musicians will know Oberheim. Not the current Oberheim keyboards, if they still exist, but um, the designer of those. So that went a few more years, and unfortunately, it, 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 even though it was a nice interface and I sold the heck out of it, uh, I did some singing at the, uh, we called them the NAM show. Actually, I went to the Music Messe in Frankfurt, so I got to use my German in Germany when we do trade shows in German, G- Germany. And uh, so that was cool. And I forget your question, but, uh, oh, I was saying back to the 90s. So, yeah, I'm back to when that year when I said, well, let's go completely freelance, so... I'm freelance again. My corporate gig is, uh, I do have a corporate client, though not a, 
not a job. So um, I got a little bass, and then I'm supplementing it with uh, voiceover music instruction, some IT work, and whatever people will uh, hire me for, I'm uh, taking now. So getting close to retirement age, although I think I'm going to go well into my 70-plus years, which voiceover is good for. I, I think it's, a, it's something you can do in your elder years if you got the chops. So I'm going to keep pursuing it and try to outrun this AI tsunami that um, I hear people warning voiceover actors about. Uh, some people saying 80% of the voiceover jobs are going to be replaced by AI. So if there's an AI calypso out there, I'm screwed. Yeah, what do you, in fact, that's a question for you if I can flip it around, Jake. Uh, what do you think about the, the AI on the horizon? I don't think it's going to take over voice acting completely. I think at this point, it's still a bit too uh, early on to make that happen. Like, I get that, of course, you know, back in, I think it's like the uh, mid to late 90s, we had things like, you know, like Microsoft Sam, where you could just type something. But, you know, there were certain phrases that you couldn't say or couldn't pull off without it sounding weird. And I think that's kind of the case with AI these days, but with, like, emotionally, they just don't, can, like, convey the same kind of emotions that a human could like you know you, you could tell a human okay jump from like i don't know you're about to blow your gasket angrily in a monologue and then completely shoot off like crazy tell an ai that and it's it's going to struggle it's going to go uh, oh dear what, what do we do we'll just put keep putting out that same voice that we've been doing through the rest of this uh preempted recording so again i personally think that it won't take over and i hope it never does because of the fact that again Voice actors like myself and and yourself as well, you know, just just human actors in general, they have so much more to offer, you know, because you can't get an AI to improvise as well. So there's that as well. The voice actors, actors, etc. They they actually bring a piece of themselves to whatever projects, you know, a piece of their kind of you know a piece of their mind, a piece of their soul. I know this kind of sounds sappy, but I still think that could really turn around projects. Like you know, it could be corporate stuff, it could be video games, anything like that. That, again, that AI, I just think, won't ever be able to uh, deliver. So that's, uh, that's my two pence right there on the whole AI fiasco going on these days. Yeah, I don't think it'll replace everybody for sure. Um, but it's the bottom end that I think people are worried about. And some people are saying, well, fine, you know, take, take those uh, $30 jobs, those free jobs, <laughs> let them go. But it's that's a stair step that is necessary in some cases to to climb. Although I witnessed it in the um, when I was doing freelance voiceover for Elance, which I think doesn't exist now. People, it's, it was like a Fiverr kind of world, and I saw the rates go three hundred, two hundred, one hundred, fifty, thirty. Mate, do you think you can do this one for free? I actually got, <laughs> I actually got inquiries. And saw auditions for voiceover jobs where they paid zero. So that, I think that drove me into the corporate world, uh, you know, 17 years ago or whatever. It's like, oh, this is not good. So I think it, it, it will be harder. And so dipping my foot back into it is a little scary. But yeah, that's where you training and getting real acting chops so that you can do things that a computer could never do. Though I have contemplated turning my voice, or especially the Calypso voice, into an AI, because there is a site that does that. So I'll let folks know if I'm going to do that. Um, I think it's like $1,000 to do it. It's on camera, too. So I thought, hmm, let's lock in this Calypso character on camera if I can, because that's the other thing. I've, I've, uh, I've had long hair most of my adult life and bear a... A similarity to the evil guy himself. So, um, so yeah, we may have to uh, become AIs to make sure we're <laughs> remembered. I don't know. It's interesting. I'm using ChatGPT, and uh, it is very handy, but it does have limits. It says some stupid stuff. So what I'm afraid of is that people get used to it, like cell phones, for instance. They don't sound as good as the analog phones in the 70s if you can get a hold of an old phone from the 70s uh, although even the switching the switching networks aren't analog anymore 
But actually, if you can hook a, an analog phone up to a 12-volt battery and talk to another analog phone, that's how we sounded back then. It's great. It's like uh, uh, the, the Neumann microphone. It's just a classic, warm, analog sound that we don't have in these digital devices. It's getting better and better. But I remember, well, both with CDs and with, uh, with cell phones, it was like, man this sounds terrible. And then realizing what well, we're just getting used to this. We think it sounds good, but it's, it's not really that good. Oh, I was going to ask your opinion about the, about analog. Uh, cause I know vinyl's coming back and, uh, whether, uh, a creative person in your line of, uh, work in the world and radio, if you have an appreciation for the analog world of the past. Okay. I'm going to admit I'm a bit of a, <laughs> <laughs> I have mixed feelings about vinyls. Uh, I prefer, personally, I prefer CDs. I just like having physical media to be able to kind of to get music off and things like that. But of course, I store stuff digitally. Vinyls, I guess I kind of see the appeal, like people wanting, like, you know, because there's still the novelty, the nostalgia that comes with vinyls. But at the same time, it comes the practicality. It's, it's big. It doesn't hold nearly as many tracks as the CD album releases have and stuff like that. And also, um, I got a personal vendetta because it's like, it's a pain in the backside when I, I go online. It's like, oh, wow, there's some rare songs of these bands I would love to hear. Oh, they're on vinyl. And I've got to send that vinyl to a mate who will eventually rip it uh, about, you know, when he feels like it three months later. So I think maybe I'm a little bit biased about uh, my opinions on vinyls and analog um, audio with all of this in mind, personally. <laughs> well, yeah, we've definitely crossed over into a much more convenient <laughs> delivery system. So I'm with you there. There is something about that old sound. Now, of course, there was hiss, tape hiss, and there's a certain crackle you get on the vinyl. There's a certain hiss in FM radio, but that the bandwidth just seemed bigger than you got a, a big sound. Anyway, enough on, uh, enough on this old duffer uh, lamenting about... Uh, the analog days. Let's jump to another question that uh, popped in my head. So, have you ever thought about, um, well, of course, you know, these days there's, uh, well, naturally, YouTube, but then you get things like SoundCloud, Bandcamp, Spotify, all stuff like that, um, getting artists out there and getting um, digital media out there to everyone. So, have you ever thought about using your musical uh, talents and doing something musical and getting it on uh, more social media platforms like, you know, I don't know, singles, EPs, or uh, teaming up with other musical uh, talents like before, but getting something like pushed out there. Have you, have you ever considered this? I've definitely considered it. Yeah, actually doing it. Well, that band, uh, The Bungee Jumping Cows, you can search that on YouTube, find uh, two albums worth of stuff. Uh, I guess it's CD Baby that has posted that. Uh, but, and then our, we have concert footage um, from a live show which uh, gives you more of the appeal, I think, although the CDs are great, especially if you can get the lyrics for that. So yeah, I'd always be open to uh, resurrecting that. I thought it was top shelf for that genre. We ruled that genre. We couldn't get played on the radio, but, um, but we ruled that genre, the science. Uh, music, good music. It's music that parents and kids could listen, both listen to. Um, so we'd have parents say, you know, this is the only CDs that we allow on road trips because everybody likes them. Otherwise, we get in fights. So, yeah, I'd be open to doing that for sure. Uh, yeah, any any project. that That's the thing. I've been a chameleon of sorts, uh, both as an actor and a singer. So it's like the, the project comes to me. Now, I am taking a songwriting class right now, and so I am kind of developing my own voice. I don't know if there's enough to turn that into an EP, but I think I will post, I'll, I'll promise to post a song on Facebook and maybe uh, my YouTube channel as well um, to start that because I, I, I've let the music slide and like I said, I consider myself a singer and musician first before the actor, so got to keep that iron in the fire as well. Well, yeah, I think uh, Serious Pipes is my YouTube channel. Um, so yeah, I'll post it there. If you're not a Facebook friend, uh, you will see it there. It's an ode to my dear friend. Actually, I'm not going to give it away because it's a, a mystery song in some sense.
When you're not acting, singing, any kind of audio editing or video editing, anything like that, when you're not doing all that kind of jazz, how do you personally like to unwind and relax? Cool. That's a great question. Although my back is not allowing me this week or probably the next week or so, um, I love basketball. I played basketball in school, and so I'm keeping that up. Um, So I watch basketball, too. Uh, The NBA is probably the sport I'm most into. Uh, My wife's Australian, so I've gotten into Aussie rules football, which is a world everybody should check out. It's an amazing sport. And so I was there for their grand final uh, a month or two ago, and actually my team, yes, if there's anybody from Australia listening, the Magpie Army is everywhere. (laughs) I was a football fan, uh, European football, soccer, uh, in the years of Ronaldinho. Um, Like I said, I'm a language addict, so I hang out at a site called uh, Free4Talk. It's the number four in the middle, freefortalk.com. And uh, you can find me in Spanish or German rooms. That is very relaxing to me. If I can switch gears and uh, turn my brain into a different language, it's... It's like a drug. I, I get addicted. So I play Duolingo, which is great for beginners. It's not really the best software that I should be using, but I can't quit, man. I can't quit. I got to get all gold badges. So <laughs> um, let's see. What else do I do? Uh, of course, sit in front of the telly like everybody and well, enjoying the California sun, getting out. We, we can walk all year long. So I'm out in the country. I do lots of walking, hiking. Oh, I do. I, I was a ham radio operator. I still am, but I haven't been using it. Uh, but I used to climb mountains and do a, a thing that's actually big in uh, your neck of the woods, I think. Uh, it's called Summits on the Air. So I'd take a little radio, five watts or less, and talk all around the country, even uh, around the world. With five watts, you get up on a hill, you can actually reach out and... Um, and make contacts. So that's that was fun, although I haven't done that in a number of years. Instead, my radio has switched over to a, a more uh, citizen, it's kind of like citizen band, um, FM, uh, where we have a fire alert network. So I founded a, uh, a group called the Cobb Alert Net, and uh, we listen to the, the firemen and pass that on to our neighbors who have little, little tiny uh, two-watt radios, $10 radios, so they get alerted uh, without having to listen to the uh, firemen all day. Um, so that's kind of a hobby. It's not exactly relaxing, but um, uses uh, uses that side of my radio skills. Mel, let me just say, it's been an absolute blast getting you on board. Thank you so much for this interview. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, I've had a number of people uh, pestering me for interviews, uh, podcasts and whatnot, and I've been postponing them as I, uh, as I try to get... Uh, keep food on the table, but so you're the first really, and I'm going to say yes to a lot more people. So I appreciate this and uh, I'm going to be listening to your other episodes uh, because I was working this morning with you playing in the background. So keep it up and best of luck with your voiceover career. Don't let those AI monsters catch you. And thank you for doing this twisted interview. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you as well. And, um, well, do you have anything you'd quickly like to say to your many fans out there, especially the Twisted Metal fan base? Yes, I've had this URL, uh, Twisted Metal News. When I first heard about the TV show, I was like, you know, I should do a little something building up to this TV release. And it's just sat there, and I've been renewing it. I will do something, because there is a season two, so there's a lot of news Uh, that comes across my feeds. Um, And I'll also give uh, some of the news will be fan stuff. So there's uh, a Facebook group I'm a part of, but I know there's a lot of other Twisted Metal groups and fans uh, out there. So once I get it going, I think it'll be a micro podcast. Um, I don't know if there's Alexa flash briefings or those equivalents of just a little minute or two, because I don't think I want to do a full podcast in Calypso voice, but a minute or two... Uh, would be just great. So watch for that, twistedmetalnews.com. 
uh, and it's just being sat on right now. But I promise, hope maybe even by uh, the time this airs, uh, there'll be something there. And folks can always write me at seriouspipes at gmail.com. And corporate clients can look me up at uh, getouttherenowmedia.com. And I'd personally like to thank all of my wonderful listeners out there for tuning into another lovely interview right here on The Cyber Den. So, Mel, thank you very much. Stay safe out there. And uh, can't wait for the next twist in metal competition. <laughs> Greetings, drivers. I am Calypso of Twisted Metal, reminding you to keep listening to Jake the Voice on The Cyber Den. Because if you don't, your neighborhood may end up being the battleground for the next Twisted Metal Tournament. 